Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's really great to see you and hear you all here this evening. It's such a fantastic vibe and buzz in the room. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Caitlin Byrne. I'm the director of the Griffith Asia Institute. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening for our 2019 Griffith Asia Lecture. In the spirit of reconciliation, let me begin this evening by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the country on which we're meeting this evening, the Turrbal and the Jagera people. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. For they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Aboriginal Australia. And of course, we have a number of distinguished guests in our audience this evening. Let me begin by acknowledging our guest of honour, Dame Meg Taylor, Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum. It is truly a delight to welcome you here. Let me also acknowledge tonight Mr. Henry Smurden, Chancellor of Griffith University, the Honourable Paul Lucas, former Deputy Premier of Queensland and now President of the Queensland Chapter of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, welcome. Miss Rosie Harris, Consul General, Consulate General of Nauru. Miss Jimmy, Mr. Jimmy Ovia, Consul General of the Consulate General of Papua New Guinea, welcome. Mr. Takeshi Tanabe, Cons Deputy Consul General from the Consul Consulate General of Japan. This is a mouthful, let me assure you. <laughs> Miss Jolie. Deputy Consul General from the Consulate General of the People's Republic of China. It's really fantastic to have the strong support of the Consular Corps here in Brisbane. Thank you for coming. Mr Kasper Kuiper, Honorary Consul for the Netherlands here in Brisbane. And Kasper, you're such a great supporter of all of our events. Once again, great to see you. Mr Bruce Miller AO, former Australian ambassador and now chair of the Griffith Asia Institute. So this is Bruce's first official function with us at GAI, fantastic. And you've got pole position, so um, that's a nice thing for you too. <laughs> Mr Derek Brown, State Director of the Department uh, of Foreign Affairs and Trade here in Queensland. Mr Chris Sains, Director of the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art members of the Griffith University Senior Executive and tonight Professor Deborah Henley, Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Griffith, Professor David Grant, Pro-Vice-Chancellor of the Griffith Business School and there are many colleagues and friends of Griffith University here in the audience and I thank you all for taking time out to come and support this event. Here in Queensland, we also have a particularly strong, well we have particularly strong and enduring links to the Pacific and they encompass ever-increasing ties to business communities, uh, ties between students and academics and schools and institutions, between cultural institutions and sporting clubs. And of course, some very rich and deep family and personal networks of the Pacifica diaspora here in Queensland. So a very warm welcome to all of you here. We're in particular delighted to have members here from the Pacific Islands Council, of Queensland, the Pacifica Women's Alliance, the Papua New Guinea Federation of Queensland, the Australia Papua New Guinea Business Council, and delegates from the Melanesian Media Freedom Forum who are all here this evening and I know they in particular had a very productive weekend of discussions. Again, I thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us this evening. And if I might make uh, one shout out to Sean and Pauline Dorney, who are also with us and fabulous supporters of the Griffith Asia Institute and wonderful connectors of Queensland to the Pacific. Thank you for being here. So welcome to the Griffith Asia Lecture. This is our fourth lecture, a fourth annual Griffith Asia Lecture, and it is a signature event for our Institute. Through this lecture, what we're trying to do is showcase leaders from across the region leaders who are actively shaping the dynamics and the discourse of the Asia Pacific, and le whose leadership inspires and informs us. These are leaders who extend our gaze, raise our horizons, contest our ideas, and inform our debates in ways that actually help us understand not just our place in the world, but who we are. 
Our neighbourhood, of course, the Asia-Pacific region, faces new challenges every day and on many levels, from the impact of shifting power dynamics and strategic great power rivalries to the existential threats of climate or a changing climate. And against this backdrop, the Pacific has come increasingly into our focus. So tonight's lecture holds particular relevance for us, Dame Meg. And you as our guest speaker, I know we're aware is playing an increasingly central role to shaping the critical debates, not just in our region, but globally, to informing policymakers and leaders about the future that we might face together. And it is truly a delight to introduce me. And let me give you just a, a taste of Dame Meg's background. And I, I keep referring to Dame Meg and she has asked me to say Meg, so I will. Um, Meg is a national of Papua New Guinea. In 2014, she was appointed by the Pacific Islands Forum leaders as Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, becoming the first woman to hold this position. Under her leadership, the Pacific Islands Forum has revitalized its approach to regionalism through the framework for Pacific regionalism and as a collective entity under the Blue Pacific Identity. A lawyer by training, Meg began her professional life as private secretary to the Chief Minister Michael Samare during self-government of Papua New Guinea and at the beginning of his tenure as Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. Prior to her appointment as Secretary General, Meg was appointed Vice President to establish the Office of the Compliance Advisor Ombudsman of the World Bank Group in 1999 under her leadership the CAO has become internationally known for its cutting edge work in addressing corporate community conflict around the globe, a model that has been replicated elsewhere by other multilateral institutions. Meg has also served as ambassador to, of Papua New Guinea to the United States, Mexico and Canada. She's been recognized by her government for her exemplary public service in 2002 and was made Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire. As Secretary General, Meg also holds the role of the Pacific Oceans Commissioner and is working alongside forum leaders to secure the, the future of the Blue Pacific Continent based on inclusion, collectivism, and the need for careful guardianship of our oceans, lands, cultures, and resources. Meg brings a much needed Blue Pacific perspective to the way that we understand and engage with the Asia-Pacific neighbourhood. Most notably, Meg, your voice and your courage in promoting collective visions, a collective narrative and leadership of the Blue Pacific, and in building diplomatic solidarity and strategies that speak to the well-being and the prosperity of the Pacific Island, Island nations is an inspiration to us all. Thank you very much and the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caitlin, and let me acknowledge <coughs> the Chancellor of, the, of Griffith, Griffith University, Mr. Henry Smurden, the senior management and academic staff of Griffith University, the Griffith Asia Institute, and of course members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen, and most of all, to the young people who are in this room, our future generations who will take care of, of the Pacific. <clears throat> Good evening, and it's an honor to have been invited to deliver this tw 2019 Griffith Asia Lecture. But first and foremost, allow me to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I also want to remind us that today is the 101st anniversary of Remembrance Day. And um, for many of you in this room and for Pacific, those from the Pacific who served and sacrificed their lives for our freedom, we say thank you and acknowledge them and their families. So I'm going to get to this lecture now and be prepared if it's long, not too long but it's an opportunity and, and I'm very pleased that you're all here. I've just come from a week at the um, Asia Pacific Strategic Studies Centre in um, 
in Honolulu with uh, other senior <coughs> military officers and um, ordinary people like myself, just considering all the issues of the geopolitics of the region. So <coughs> in my um, talk this, this evening, I will touch a bit on these issues. But to begin, let me say that we live in unprecedented times of profound and rapid change. While the complexity and scale of this change often tests our abilities to respond, nonetheless, the actions, partnerships and alliances we commit to today will define the course of our development and achievements for the next several decades. So this evening I have chosen to frame this lecture <clears throat> around the geopolitics, particularly focusing on, firstly, climate change, secondly, economy, and thirdly, security, including that of our maritime boundaries. And I will then conclude with a few pointers on immediate next steps for the Pacific Islands Forum Collective. Before I elaborate further on this lecture, and for the benefit of those who may not be familiar, allow me to speak briefly to the Pacific Island Forum and the architecture. Founded in 1971, today the Pacific Island Forum grouping comprises 18 member countries, 16 self-governing states and two territories, and they are the French territories. The leaders of the 18 countries constitute the Pacific Island Forum and meet on an annual basis. The most recent meeting being the 50th Pacific Island Forum meeting in Tuvalu. So whilst the leaders meeting sits at the pinnacle of the regional architecture, I also recognise the forum ministerial meetings which take carriage of the operationalisation of the leaders' decisions, primarily those other forum economic ministers and the forum foreign ministers. Ladies and gentlemen, the forum leader's vision is for a region of peace, harmony and security, social, social inclusion and prosperity so that all Pacific people can lead free, healthy and productive lives. The Pacific Islands Forum works to achieve this through the framework for Pacific regionalism by fostering cooperation between governments, ensuring inclusive policy dialogue mechanisms and by representing the priorities and interests of its members internationally. Since 2017, the Pacific Island Forum has galvanised its representation under the Blue Pacific identity. The Blue Pacific represents our recognition that as a region we are large, connected and strategically important. It speaks to our collective potential and our shared stewardship of the Pacific Ocean. It underlies our ownership of our ocean space, Pacific people taking control of our domain, critical to managing our own resources, our ocean resources, biodiversity, ecosystems and data, as well as for fighting the impacts of climate change. It is through this narrative that leaders of the region see opportunities to not only secure the future of the Pacific, but also, as Epeli Haofa of Tonga des described it, to realise a new era of autonomy following the achievement of political independence. History has shown that the Pacific Islands Forum has been at its best in moments of challenge when our solidarity and resolve have been both necessary and tested. It was during these challenging moments that our leaders sat around the table as sovereign nations and collectively found a way forward to deliver solutions in the best interests and well-being of our people. What has this regional solidarity and resolve looked like? Three prime examples come to mind. The Rarotonga Treaty which establishes a nuclear weapon-free zone in the Pacific and was adopted by leaders in the Cook Islands in August 1985. The Bikatawa Declaration, adopted by the leaders in the year 2000, provided the framework for the regional assistance mission to the Solomon Islands, otherwise known as Ramsey. And in 2015, the Pacific's instrumental role in concluding 
what was perhaps the toughest global negotiation ever, the Paris Agreement. These milestones are not insignificant and reflect the political strength of the collective. As I have suggested earlier, we find ourselves at another watershed moment in our collective history, where we will be defined, remembered and judged on the action we take together as a regional grouping. However, the stakes are perhaps higher now than they have ever been before. In the current context, defined by a glo global climate crisis, the future for many countries of the Pacific is not guaranteed. Indeed, for many Pacific Island countries, questions about the future of our region are existential ones. Despite the many challenges within our region, Forum leaders maintain collective recognition of the long-term and strategic potential for establishing an instrumental political bloc and a viable Blue Pacific continent. It is against this backdrop that Forum leaders endorse the development of a 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific continent at their meeting in Tuvalu this year. However, we are not naive to the fact that securing our future on our terms and through our will presents enormous challenges. We know there is much to do to achieve this, but the Pacific Islands Forum understands its agency in the strategic political arena that is supported by a regional architecture and operates as a regional diplomatic bloc. To quote the Prime Minister of Samoa, the Honourable Tualepa Mali, Malia Lenga Oi, quote, the Blue Pacific identity that we have embraced will ensure that our smallness will have an expanded outreach and our collective voice will soar above the roar of the angry tides. The recognition of our Earth without borders resonates with the need for a global outlook, international cooperation and solidarity and a shared strategy to address the challenges we face." End of quote. We must be unwavering in the face of our challenges, most especially during this sensitive time of geopolitical positioning across the world. We see claims that the Indian and Pacific Oceans are a single strategic space. We see opposing ideals and perspectives of our space. For instance, the US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, earlier this year claimed, the United States and Australia are neighbours united rather than divided by the vast emptiness of Pacific waters. A comment that stands in stark contrast to histories of Pacific people and the Blue Pacific narrative. Amongst all competing claims, the broader question being debated is whether multilateralism in this age of bilateralism can still be relevant. I would argue that without it, the strength of small economies will be of naught. Collectivism is at the core of our political strength, a measure that recognises our culture and community. This diagrammatic interpretation by James Cox surmises quite simply the heightened geopolitical engagement and competition in our region. We continue to see a growing number of new foreign policy commitments to our island region by a multitude of ge geopolitical players. <coughs> Whilst these new initiatives and instruments may be beneficial to our foreign members, it is critical that at a regional level we carefully consider these interventions to ensure that they actually enhance and contribute to strengthening the existing regional architecture, rather than establishing parallel institutions and processes. We must work together to ensure that regional solidarity is not undermined and our ability to collectively address the key priorities determined by our leaders for the Blue Pacific are not hampered. Ladies and gentlemen, I turn now to our economies. Yes, our land economies are small and vulnerable to a range of structural factors that are incongruent with typical models of development 
and the impacts of disasters. Generally, the mainstays of our island economies are fisheries and tourism. The changing climate, however, presents challenges to these sectors of our economy. Take agriculture, for instance. Productivity is significantly reduced as a result of climate change, in turn impacting food security. An equally critical challenge is sustainable and cost-effective cost infra infrastructure development in the face of extreme climatic vulnerabilities. Our long-term economic performance requires investment in development. It requires investment that supports quality infrastructure to mobilise and connect Pacific people. However, coupled with the current debt capacity of our island economies, the critical balance now lingers between three key factors. Required investment in infrastructure, additional debt creation, and the minimisation of probable debt distress. But many of you in this room are very familiar with that. At a bilateral level, it is encouraging to see island countries leveraging the increased engagement from partners to help drive their national development ambitions. It is no secret that the economic prospects for the Pacific economies rely significantly on the outlook of our major trading partner economies. Major trading partners for the forum grouping, which I'm including Australia and New Zealand in this, um, is China, the European Union, Japan, and the United States of America. Together, these countries represent 45% of, of the 2019 global GDP highlighting the magnitude of our partnering trading market. The sum of the forum's share of the global economy stands at just over 1.3% of 2019 GDP levels. However, collectively, our regional strength, coupled with our vast oceanic resources, can be catalytic for our advancement. So allow me to take a moment to elaborate this point with the example of fisheries. The Pacific is home to one of the last remaining sustainable tuna resources in the world. The importance of the tuna industry and its interconnectedness with the global community cannot be overemphasized. Ultimately, the global tuna trade is impacted by market access, access standards, and the behavior of consumers. Together, these increasingly influence the way the industry deals with sustainability and social accountability issues of our fisheries. The parties to the Nauru Agreement was born out of a group of countries who shared a vision to assert greater control of their fisheries so that they could receive a bigger and fairer share of their resources. Established in 2010, the parties to the Nauru Agreement has become one of the most innovative and effective regional organisations in the world, transforming the value of the economic returns of the tuna fishery from US 60 million to US 500 million in just under a decade. This burgeoning resource market, coupled with the strength and maritime surveillance capabilities of the Forum Fisheries Agency and strengthening management measures, will position and secure the Pacific fisheries industries for further diversified success in the future. We'll now turn to security and the key element of geostrategic competition. We continue to observe a multitude of security measures and initiatives introduced in the region, including the expansion of the naval bases at Lombrum on Manus Island and in Northern Australia, Reportedly, there is also a proposal for a naval base at Stirling Island in Western Solomon Islands. Perhaps an apt observation is that of Vanuatu's foreign minister, the Honourable Ralph Rengenbanu, who has, who has questioned this, as he says, increasing militarisation of the Pacific. For the forum more specifically, the security priorities of our region are defined through the Boy Declaration, agreed to by leaders at their meeting in Nauru in 2018. The fundamental basis of the Boy Declaration 
is an, extend, is an expanded concept of security that includes human security, economic security, and environmental security. Importantly, it is through the Boy Declaration that the leaders reaffirmed climate change as the single greatest threat to the livelihoods, security, and well-being of the peoples of the Pacific and their commitment to progress the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Independent of the boy, I recognise and acknowledge the country-led initiatives by Australia, which contribute to strengthening the security capabilities of Pacific Island governments. I'm encouraged that key initi initiatives, such as the Pacific Fusion Centre, has now transitioned into the existing regional architecture, demonstrating the government's recognition that, you, that the initiative be region-led. This is an example of a successful alignment of a regional priority with an initiative that furthers the aim of Australia, Australia's national foreign policy for stronger security integration across the region. Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn to the region's greatest security threat, climate change. In reaffirming climate change as the single greatest threat facing the Blue Pacific, Forum leaders declared this past August a climate change crisis facing Pacific Island nations. Leaders agreed that climate change action is a key priority for the development of a 2050 strategy and issued the Kanaka Lua Declaration for Urgent Climate Action Now. The global climate crisis is already destroying the integrity and well being of our ocean which is so fundamental to our future viability as Pacific peoples. The Intergovern Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, its special report on 1.5 degrees provides clear evidence of the scale of the threat posed to our region by global temperature rise. Further, the most recent IPCC special report on the oceans and chirosphere, chirosphere means water that is solid, you know, the Arctic and Antarctica, provides the clear, clearest scientific evidence yet that the destructive impacts the climate cr crisis will have on the health and integrity of our ocean and its resources. Unfortunately, this is a shared future we all face because of a small minority of countries unwilling to step up their political commitments and take tangible, genuine and ambitious action under the Paris Agreement to reduce global warming and prevent a climate catastrophe. The science is clear. We must reduce global CO2 emissions by about 45% by 2030 and, need, and achieve a global net zero emission around 2050 if we are to keep global temperature risk down to 1.5 degrees. Pacific Island countries have set ambitious, nationally determined contributions, despite the fact that they account for just 0.03% of emissions. And the nationally determined contributions are very much focused on a conversion of energy from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Ambitious action is required from all parties to the Climate Convention. Ambitious action that will require unprecedented transition in energy, land, urbanisation, infrastructure and industrial systems. It is perhaps appropriate that as we approach the 50th anniversary of the Pacific Island Forum, which will be in 2021, we embark on the development of a 2050 strategy for a blue Pacific continent. It's an, it is an, it's an opportunity to ask what might we do now in any way to help avoid or prepare for these security risks posed by climate change. Perhaps the most obvious but nonetheless urgent action required for realising the Blue Pacific Continent is securing our maritime boundaries. Firstly, securing treaty between states. This is currently a priority for forum leaders that is becoming more urgent due to the impacts of sea level rise. 
There is currently no international legal provisions to protect the jurisdiction of Pacific Island countries and territories from the impact of climate change and sea level rise. However, this is an area that we are now pursuing through a submission to the International Law Commission. Pacific governments are pushing the boundaries of international law. In 2018, Pacific leaders of both the Polynesian Leaders Group and the parties to the Nauru Agreement declared that their maritime boundaries will remain in perpetuity and will not be compromised by climate change. The Republic of Marshall Islands has unilaterally declared by ministerial order the geographical coordinates of the limits of the maritime zones regardless of sea level rise. Perhaps making a similar declaration at the regional level is the first step towards securing our ocean continent in the face of climate change and building a body of customary international law as we do that. Another concrete option is to invest in small scale resilient development at the community level. This is the purpose of the Pacific Resilience Facility endorsed by forum leaders and economic ministers. The facility aims to facilitate government financing support for community level resilience projects that will prepare them for climate induced disasters and natural disasters. We haven't got the money yet, but that's the plan. <laughs> Finally, perhaps the simplest action we can do now is to engage the people of the Pacific, particularly our young people, in discussions about our future. Indeed, as leaders stated, through their endorsement of the Blue Pacific, it is about all Pacific peoples comprising our ocean of islands who recognise their needs and potential, who plan and own their development agenda and who can act collectively for the good of all rather than a few. These discussions will be sensitive ones, as they are likely to involve questions about the relocation of people, communities, and even cities. They will touch on issues of loss and sacrifice as we weigh up the risks of a changing climate in the context of our existing vulnerabilities and dependencies. So ladies and gentlemen, as we move forward as one ocean continent, I will reiterate and continue to reiterate that any engagement with the Pacific must take note and respect these circumstances as this is how we have managed to remain a stable and secure region. After all, the momentum of the Blue Pacific reminds and inspires us all to value the strategic potential of the region and to act from a position of strength. I thank you all for being here. I thank you all for listening to what I have to say on behalf of my colleagues at the Secretariat and those of us who work for the CROP agencies, the Council of Regional uh, Organisations. I want to acknowledge many old friends who are here, um, those who've spent many time in my own country in Papua New Guinea, Sean. And to say um, again that um, I'm available now for you can ask me all the questions you want that I couldn't put in my official paper. <laughs> Thank you. We do have time for questions and we have a couple of roving mics. Or maybe I'm holding one. Uh, we have a roving mic. Um, if you would like to put up your hand and please let us know where you're from. And I can see the first question, Stefan, at the back. Hello, Stefan Armbrust from SBS News. I'm, I'm here, <coughs> here with the Melanesian Media Freedom Forum. It's a meeting of Pacific Island journalists um, in Brisbane uh, this week. Uh, Dame Meg, um, I was just wondering if you could uh, give the journalist some sort of statement about the importance of the media in the Pacific in terms of a pillar of democracy and the attacks that we've seen on the media recently, specifically um, in the last few weeks in terms of what's been happening in Vanuatu and Kiribati. I, I can't comment on what the governments did there, you know that. Can you, can you comment on the importance then of but the... But I can comment on the importance of media. Um, I, I think
think my own position as Secretary General, but also um, Pacific Island Forum uh, as a collective does value the media. You know, you saw the conduct of um, the meeting in Tuvalu and how media was very well involved and, and uh, briefed, addressed, participated in many discussions that we had and also preparing Pacific journalists for the forum and we do that every year. Transparency and uh, the opportunity for people to know what is going on in their countries is very, very important. I don't know if when you went into these countries and got told to leave, whether you put it, were clear about what your intention was when you went in there. And I think, I, I think that we can have a debate about that at some point, but I think that for me personally, I think that's really very important that you be very upfront about what you want to ask, the kind of questions. Because I think there is sensitivities in many of some, in some of our countries not knowing what journalists are there, what they're asking for, because it's not, it's not as if there's a, a culture of, of continuous openness about these of issues that happen there. I think there was a question in that same row. If you'd like to pass the microphone down. Dame Meg, uh, thank you very much. My name's Jason McLeod. I'm from the University of Sydney. Uh, I have a question about West Papua. I note that West Papua is a member of the Melanesian Spearhead Group. And I also noticed that the issue of West Papua has surfaced as part of the, the framework on regionalism. And I'm curious to know what you think it might take for West Papua to become a member of the Pacific Island Forum and for forum countries to address the issue of West Papua. Thank you. West Papua's been, thank you for your question. West Papua's been on the leader's agenda since 2000. This year, the issue of West Papua was addressed very succinctly in the communique. It was about requiring action by the uh, UN C Commissioner for Human Rights, who had originally been invited about 18 months ago to visit West Papua. That has not happened. And um, the Secretariat, we've been pursuing this with, the, uh, with um, uh, Michelle Bachelet, who is the uh, Commissioner, to try to get them to go into Indonesia. But they can only go in if the, if the sovereign state uh, welcomes them to come in and provides and ensures that they are secure while they are there. So this is, um, this is the intention that, or oh, well, this is what the leaders of the Pacific would like to see. They are also uh, much more determined to have action before the next leaders meeting, which will be in Vanuatu the first week of August. 2020. Um, whether that will happen or not, we don't know, but we keep in touch with both sides, both Indonesia as well as, um, as uh, the, the UN on this. Whether West Papua will become a member of the um, Pacific Island Forum, uh, uh, I'd say that uh, that's a decision the leaders will have to make, but I think it's a long shot. <coughs> A couple of other questions. We might actually, if we can come down to Emma in the middle here, and then we'll come back to the questions at the back. Thank you. Um, the name is Emma Voidi. I'm the president of the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland. Um, thank you, Dame, for the presentation. I'd like to ask, uh, and if you may uh, elaborate on the role of civil society organizations, uh, because we've been involved in, in some of the um, development around that. The role of civil society organizations in um, the decision making around governance in various uh, dialogue, in, in particular in the region. If you could let okay. us know about your stand. Thanks. So Makere, so Makere Marout, a former Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, was asked to come in and do a review of the Pacific Plan. And one of the recommendations there was for a much more inclusive approach. So the approach we've taken um, uh, since my tenure is to ensure that there is 
much more dialogue with civil society, but a structured dialogue. So for instance, um, internally, um, I chair a session with civil society representation three times a year to go through issues. For the meeting of the foreign economic ministers, civil society have a conversation directly with the finance ministers and economic ministers. At the leaders, at the leaders meeting, civil society also has a, has a conversation uh, but, I mean, it's structured. They, have, they prepare what they're going to say and, then the, and it's a, a dialogue with the leaders. The leaders respond to their issues and the West Papua issue was a very much one that came up in this year's conversation. We also have had the um, specialist subcommittee which takes issues from all across the region. But at the moment, this is under review at the request of our, uh, of our government. So, I think it's a, there's been a momentum. I would hope that it would not disappear. Where it's not as if there's a population of 100 million in the Pacific. We're all part of this and we're all in this together. And many civil society organizations have very strong technical abilities in the work that they do, particularly around issues around for women, you know, and violence against women. That's the areas that we do some close work with. And um, the EU has been a great supporter of the non-state actors program that the, that the Secretariat runs and the dialogue with um, private sector and but particularly with civil society. I often tell the, the delegate from the European Union that of all their investments in the Pacific, this is the one that they should always keep going because it's really important to invest in people. I think two more questions. Oh, I'm happy to go. Are you as happy long to as keep going? Hungry. All right. Uh, there were a few hands I saw up the back, and there's one right in the middle. There's one. Two. Keep them up high so our roving mic can <coughs> find you. Hi, Dave Meg. Thanks so much. Um, I'm hello. Kate Lyons from The Guardian. Um, you oh, hello, Kate. Hello. Nice to see you again. It's a good recording um, there. You mentioned in your in your talk yep. that the the clim the reality that people in the Pacific are facing as a result of the climate crisis is due to a few nations who are unwilling to take urgent action to reduce emissions. I'm wondering if you would count Australia in that group of countries, <laughs> and how much of an ally you feel that Australia is. In New Guinea, where are we? <laughs> um, look, uh, Australia was a signet. I mean. So was at the meetings with us, uh, with the leaders in uh, Tuvalu. They are a member of the forum. The Kanake Declaration is, Australia took part in that. I think um, it's, uh, it, its approach, maybe not what we had all hoped that it would you know, be an immediate statement that we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Um, I have to say that with all these bushfires, I've been watching on the news, it makes you wonder what, how people are discussing or facing the reality of the impact of climate change. I think the two biggest contributors, the United States and China, and in a statement that I made in front of the Vice Minister of China in Samoa about three weeks ago, we asked them to work closely with us at the um, negotiations at the um, UNFCCC and to address their uh, NDCs. Uh, with the US, as you know, they've now saying that they're, withdraw they're withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, but they'll be able to sit on committees and be there for negotiations right up until the end of, the, I think it's uh, sometime next year, the day before the US elections. I think everybody has to do their bit. Every member of the forum, including Australia and New Zealand's just now passed legislation on a, on a what do you call it, a 2050 carbon neutral um, position. And up with, but Australia has to make those decisions as a member of the Pacific family now that we're very much related. Uh, 
Uh, uh, my name is Tapananga Rokbena. Um, I'm a current member of the Pacific Climate Warriors Brisbane team, as well as the former Vice President of the University of Queensland South Pacific Island Association. Um, just before I go on to my question, I just want to touch on the gentleman from SBS's point here. Um, I think you answered it correctly. We all know that 60 Minutes is all about kidnapping children in Lebanon, so um, I don't think they probably did the right conduct in Kiribati either. Um, but now on to my point. Um, you touched in your speech about um, youth engagement um, and uh, Pacific youth engagement. Um, as Pacific youth living in um, diaspora here in Australia, um, New Zealand and America, um, what is your point of view? Uh, like, what is what would you recommend as the Secretary and Pacific Islands Forum? Um, what would you recommend on behalf of Pacific Island Forum and the Secretariat on we, what we as Pacific youth should do um, out here, living away from our homelands? Um, so, like for example, uh, being part of Pacific Climate Warriors, we've done a whole lot of things like Rise Pacific Power, um, the Zero Carbon Bill in New Zealand. Um, and participated in a lot of the climate change strikes alongside Greta um, and her crew. Um, what is f coming from the Pacific Islands Forum, what would you recommend we as youth do for our islands and engaging in um, talks about climate change within our youth? I think all of us have, cannot stop advocating for the position of the Pacific. And, uh, at, you know, and I'll be really honest with you, sometimes I just, I despair when I see that there isn't the passion and the commitment to change that we, we need. The people of the Pacific are very much at the front line of this. If you go to our atoll states, like Tuvalu, Kiribati and Marshall Islands, life there is very different from the life that those of us who come from places where there is land that we can grow our food and farm. A lot of people just don't understand that. Sometimes when I go to visit the Marshalls, I sit on Kwajalein for a, quite a while on that aircraft. We're not allowed off because it's American territory. Because the sea has covered the airfield or the airstrip, we have to wait for the sea to, to uh, recede and then for them to clean up the airport before, uh, airstrip before we can land. But for people who live there all the time, and I've just spent a week with a young man in the course I did from there, and uh, just how much life has changed since he was a little boy, that now there is just no land there. I mean, the sand is there, but it's the, it's the diet, the nutrition, a way of life, of custom, everything has changed. The climate warriors are part of this whole conversation that we have and we have to keep and I thank you all for your commitment to it and you cannot let up on it you just have to keep educating people um, I think my colleague Nicola has some of the Kanaka declaration pamphlets did you bring them but we'll get your we'll get your address and we'll get them to you to get out but I think the advocacy and international advocacy and advocacy on campuses in Australia very important because it's the people in the end who will make all this turn this around. Thank you. If we just go right behind Samit. Uh, thank you, Dame Meg. My name is Samit Suleiman. I'm at Griffith University. One of the um, increasingly important uh, parts of the climate security equation is human mobility, and you touched on some of these issues in your, in your remarks. But increasingly, uh, some of those human mobility challenges will become international. Right, so international border crossings will become increasingly prevalent uh, for a whole variety of reasons. And I'm wondering uh, about the extent to which you find promise and potential in Pacific regionalism and Pacific multilateralism in coming up with new solutions to this really difficult and thorny complex problem. It's a really um, sensitive question. So for instance, in Fiji, there's been already movement of people into higher ground, huh? but that's done internally. In Papua New Guinea, we also have issues of communities um, on the Cataract Islands huh? that need to, to be relocated. But it's not a conversation that a lot of people want to have. And what I've said tonight in, that, in my speech is as, as far as I will go. I don't 
go out and get in front of the leaders on this. Because if you look at what happened in Kiribati, whatever the politics of Taiwan and China are, the, the president changed the narrative of Kiribati about we're not going to pack up and we're leaving. We have had stewardship of our islands for generations and we are going to stay and we are going to be involved in the development of our country. I noticed such a real change in people and the positiveness of people and how they took care of their homes, their little gardens, but their attitude of public servants as well as we, as we would work with them. The thought of just packing up and leaving is not sure. It's, it's a frightening thought. I think when Prime Minister Sapawanga was Prime Minister of Tuvalu, he was much more forthright about it. He had thought it through and realised that at some point this may have to happen. But it wasn't as if he was in a rush to do that. But he would talk about it, that climate migration was going to be a consequence of this and we had to address it. From a regional point of view, I think that um, you know, Kiribati has, uh, bought, as you know, bought land in uh, Fiji. And I think other countries, whether they'd open their doors, I'm sure that if the situation was dire, there would be opportunities for people. But the, the broader issues that is, you know, you absorb people into your society, then what is there for them to do? What is there, you know, how does, how they get involved in the economy and whether the countries can afford to be supporting an, in a, um, an inundation of other populations. I know there's a question just here at the front. From West Papua. Can we bring it to an end? Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, okay, a few more. My only chance. <laughs> yeah. Wah, 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 wah. Um, my name is Samatus Dow. Uh, I came from West Papua, but I live in Australia, and I'm representing uh, my people of West Papua and uh, Free Papua Movement. As I say, wah, 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 wah is a West Papuan greetings for the uh, people, for the leaders. I understand that. You are one of our Pacific leaders. This is uh, my and my people honor to you. And I also um, uh, take this moment to uh, raise uh, my uh, concern about uh, the West Papua issue today, which is uh, related with climate change and armed conflict and, yeah, uh, Another issue. So, um, what international community know about the issue of West Papua is just uh, concentrate on your human rights issue. But what been happening silently in West Papua is um, the armed conflict, which is uh, been happening quite a long time. Uh, the armed conflict were between Indonesian military and also the West Papua Liberation Army. Just uh, currently, because of the armed conflict, about 40,000 yeah, 40, West Papuans become uh, internally displaced people. And also, uh, with the armed conflict, uh, the Indonesians uh, helicopter, they bombed the area in West Papua, and I'm sure that environmentally is detracted. We understand and we recognize as a West Papuan, West Papua is one of the land for the, you know, for the earth, which is uh, one of the rainforest country, and. What my question is, 
from the past that I have been, you know, flowing with the regional mechanism on the issue of West Papua, just the human rights issue, but basically a humanitarian issue and the army conflicts never raised by any other country in the Pacific, even the Vanuatu. They, but they currently, because of the international uh, media, the raising up about the current issue of army conflict. In terms of the Pacific Regional Security Mechanism, there is any proper mechanism that how to uh, protect or look in the way the both party, the Indonesia and the West Papua, to be, you know, the regional you know, Pacific uh, authority to mediate internationally, you know, uh, mediate negotiation. Because the, today the West Papuan people through the pre Papua movement and liberation army, they, they don't like to engage with the dialogue with Indonesia. Even the president of Indonesia say that it's just, you know, proposing a dialogue, but... Yeah. Let me... Um answer that in the sense of whether the, the, the Pacific could play a role in uh, mediate, mediating between the government of Indonesia and West Papuans. The, uh, the government of Indonesia sees us as an interested party. We had asked whether we could have uh, one of our uh, representation on, a on the delegation with the UN Commission of Human Rights when they would go into West Papua and that has been denied. Although we have gone in and monitored elections there, but under strict supervision of the Indonesian government. So I think that uh, the Commission for Human Rights, you know, and uh, the commissioner herself, Bachelet, is the one that we are really urging and trying to ensure that they can get entry into, um, into West Papua so they can cover a broad range of issues whilst they are there. Meg, you've been incredibly generous with your time this evening. We actually may need oh, to got... call to a bring tonight okay. to a close, I'm sorry. I think we could go on. There's a lady right at the back who's had her hand up. This one. Yeah. Danelle. <laughs> one more. Okay. The mic's coming to you. Thank you, Dame Meg. It's been wonderful to have you. My name's Donnell Davis. I'm with the United Nations Association of Australia. And we've been trying to set up United Nations uh, uh, associations in the Pacific, but we've been unsuccessful. Now you say, why bother? Well, the thing is, we're allowed to say things that politicians can't. We're also expected to be the voice of the people, and we're able to articulate and interrogate all the undiscussables. So when it comes time for us to communicate, we can say things that the government can't, but not in a disrespectful way, in a very respectful way. I would like to be really cheeky and say, how can we set up a United Nations Association to be the people's voice with the South Pacific Forum if we can't do it country by country? And 18 countries are a lot of countries to try and organise. And um, is there a better way that we in Australia can help you? But well, that sounds very patronising. How can we support you to, to actualise what you need? Mm. Um, I mean, the UN has uh, res reps in, uh, re you know, the new, the, under the new system. Huh? So the, I think the UN has a, lot, a big presence in the Pacific. And I know this is an association, but um, I, I mean, I don't understand why it's so hard for you not to be able to set up an association. But perhaps we can discuss that off offline. All right. It's been fantastic to have such a long conversation with you, Meg. I wonder if I could now invite Bruce Miller to deliver a vote of thanks. I can go all night talking about the business. Well, uh, Dame Meg, thank you for being so generous with your time and for being what I would call the very model of a modern Secretary General. Uh, and if I could sing, I would sing it, but I can't sing, so I won't. But uh, in the face, in fact, of quite challenging questions uh, from uh, many members of the audience, uh, which I think showed how stimulating everyone found uh, what you had to say, 
I just have three things I want to zero in on, if I might, in my vote of thanks. And that is to say, to thank you for drawing attention once again to that very important point about the value of multilateral, multilateral action. The way in which um, sovereign countries can uh, multiply their voice their voices, their collective voices in the international system through collective action together. So the differences, big differences in economic and military power, of course they are there, but through effective uh, multilateral diplomacy, uh, how small countries can actually make uh, quite a big impact internationally. We have to remember that lesson and, uh, and at a time when in fact multilateral rules-based frameworks are in all areas are under considerable challenge uh, for a range of reasons I think we're all aware of. So that's my, my first point. My second point is to thank you for a wonderful example of what I would call integrated analysis, bringing together the political, the strategic, uh, the economic, uh, and indeed the sort of the grassroots elements. Uh, uh, there's too little of that out there in the world, too much debate solely in the economic sphere, too much debate solely in the security sphere. All these spheres have to talk to one another, and I think your presentation this evening has uh, demonstrated amply uh, how far we can go if we actually do make those linkages. And finally, I would really, just really wanted to say how impressive I found the way in which you balanced um, uh, making, you know, passion, passion with a rational and persuasive set of arguments. Uh, that's actually quite lacking in the, uh, in the public sphere in many countries these days. There's either too much passion and too little persuasive analytical work or too, or, too, or too little passion and too much just dry analysis. Bringing it together, uh, being persuasive, uh, tough messages but with a wonderful tone. Uh, that's the way to be persuasive. So you're a model to us all in how we should uh, conduct ourselves uh, internationally. So thank you very much uh, from us all here in the audience for the time that you've given. I know too that you got off an aeroplane from Honolulu this morning, so I'm sure you're probably exhausted. Uh, and yet uh, uh, we, wouldn't have noted, we wouldn't have noticed that if you, if, uh, if you hadn't confessed that to me on the walk across here this evening. So thanks once again. Thank you.